Hello YouTube, Rishi Sunak has asked me to keep this intro as short as possible, so I'll be interrupting this clip in the middle of this sentence. And we start today with the eastern leg of HS2, which is due to run from Birmingham to Sheffield, Leeds and York. Final confirmation of whether or not the eastern leg will go ahead will be contained within the integrated rail plan, which after several delays is finally due to be published sometime this September. Now many newspapers in recent weeks have speculated that HS2 uh, eastern leg is due to be cancelled. And in fact High Speed 2 Limited themselves have confirmed that work on planning the eastern leg has been paused since June. This comes a year and a half after the Okavi review, which was a review of whether or not HS2 as a whole should go ahead, uh, was published. Background construction on Phase 1 between London and Birmingham has been ongoing since 2017, with the go-ahead for major works being given in April 2020, and Phase 2A from Birmingham to Crewe was given royal assent earlier this year. It's expected that the western side of Phase 2B from Crewe to Manchester will be given royal assent early 2022. So where does that leave the eastern leg? About half a year ago, the National Infrastructure Commission published a report suggesting that the eastern leg could be deferred, with improvements to the existing Midland and main line in the interim instead. So is that a workable alternative to HS2 East? Well in my view the Midland main line needs to be electrified as far as Sheffield and even better Leeds as an absolute imperative regardless of whether or not HS2 Phase 2B goes ahead. As for the section between Birmingham and the East Midlands, well that's where the problem really lies because there simply isn't any workable alternative. The current route between Birmingham and Derby is just simply not suitable for intercity use in the long term. And even the National Infrastructure Committee report suggests that the first part of the eastern leg between Birmingham should be built as far as East Midlands Parkway. That only solves part of the problem, it still creates a capacity problem north of East Midlands Parkway. Last year there were suggestions in various parts of the media that Northern Powerhouse Rail could be repurposed as a quasi-extension of the eastern leg to reach Leeds via Manchester. Repeating what I've said before, this is a really bad idea because it means routing uh, leads to London and leads to Birmingham passengers through Manchester, eating up a huge amount of capacity on Northern Powerhouse Rail, taking seats away from passengers going between Liverpool and Manchester and Leeds in the North East, which is what Northern Powerhouse Rail is supposed to do. Furthermore, it also means the through station in Manchester, whatever form it eventually takes, becomes a major bottleneck. And if the last few years should have taught us anything, it's that setting up a major capacity bottleneck in the centre of Manchester is a really bad idea. That's why this really matters to Manchester, and in fact it should matter to everybody in the North and the Midlands. Indeed, the West Yorkshire Mayor Tracy Braben has called for the scheme to go ahead. On the other hand, the Conservative Mayor of the West Midlands, Andy Street, who is supportive of HS2 in general, has recently suggested that the Eastern Leg might not actually be that important. So, will it go ahead? Well, we'll find that out when the Integrated Rail Plan is published, and that will also give us some more details about Northern Powerhouse Rail, trans Pennine electrification, and hopefully some other much-needed electrification schemes. Moving on from one major rail controversy to another, let's talk about the East Coast Mainline timetable for May 2022, which has now been deferred to May 2023 at the earliest. Well, back in ye olden days before the pandemic, the government promised LNER's predecessor Virgin Trains East Coast a path to run a third hourly service between London and Newcastle. Now, someone somewhere along the line went, uh-oh, we've got a capacity problem north of York, someone else is going to have to cut a service. And that book goes to Trans Pennine Express, who, uh, under this new timetable, would terminate their Manchester Airport to Newcastle services in York. At the same time, the Liverpool-Newcastle-Edinburgh services would be cut back to Newcastle, apart from five trains a day, uh, which would otherwise be empty stock runnings because the Class A02s are based in Craig and Tenney in Edinburgh. Other planned changes as part of this timetable were a rebalancing of LNER calls at Darlington and Durham, with the new Newcastle service calling at both stations and the slower of the two Edinburgh services alternating calls between Darlington and Durham. This would mean a slight decrease in callings for Darlington and a slight increase in callings for Durham. In the long term, there are plans for new platforms to be added to Darlington, which could increase callings there in the future. Other changes include a new direct LNER service from London to Cleethorpes, extending the present Lincoln service and a daily direct service between London and Huddersfield. This would be a morning departure from Huddersfield and an evening return from London. Meanwhile, the direct LNER service to Sunderland would be withdrawn. All of this was due to happen in May 2022. However, some pretty big problems emerged. First and foremost, the timetable was not popular, especially the reduction of Trans Pennine services. Uh, that throw in some problems with infrastructure, the cracks problems with the Class 800 type trains, 
and other various timetabling problems with the shadow of the May 2018 disaster looming large, the sensible decision was taken to just defer the whole thing. It's unclear at this point whether some smaller elements of the timetable, like the Lincoln service extension to Cleethorpes and the services to Huddersfield, will go ahead or not in May 2022. They might just scrap it and rewrite the whole thing from scratch. Who knows? All of these woes on the East Coast mainline point to a larger problem, which is that there is a capacity problem between York and Newcastle, and with both High Speed 2 Eastern Leg, if it goes ahead, and Northern Powerhouse Rail currently due to terminate south of York, this problem is clearly going to get worse in the coming decades. Someone somewhere is going to have to come up with a solution. LNER will press ahead with the introduction of a new direct daily service to Middlesbrough in December 2021, taking advantage of platform extensions at the station. In the long term, the eventual plan is to create a once every two hours direct service to Middlesbrough uh, by extending the current York Terminator. A brand new open access operator, East Coast Trains run by First, is due to start operating this October between London King's Cross and Edinburgh via Newcastle, also calling it Stevenage and Morpeth. The service will use Class 803 trains, similar to the Class 801s but painted in bright purple. The aim is to compete with both coaches and airlines on the route, and the trains will be standard class only. A quick update to this story. Since filming the main part of this video, First East Coast has revealed the brand name for its new service, LUMO. LUMO will initially run two trains per day between London and Edinburgh from the 25th of October, eventually increasing to five, with fares starting as low as £15, with journey times similar to existing LNER trains at about four and a half hours. The company are employing a wide range of tools to advertise their services, including my YouTube comments section, apparently. Moving on, Transpennine Express has now accepted the last of its Mark V sets, meaning all three of the new Nova fleets are now in service. The first 15 of the Class 185s are currently due to go off-lease at the end of 2021, although with no plans of where they will actually go or what they'll do. Services between Manchester Airport and Middlesbrough, which were extended to Redcar Central in December 2019, will now be extended through to the end of the line at Saltburn-on-Sea. Again, this is due to happen in May 2022. It's not obvious at this point whether that will still go ahead in May 2022 or if that is being deferred along with the rest of the timetable. Transpennine Express, or maybe Northern, had been due to take over operation of the Liverpool Lime Street to Nottingham service, which was due to be split up from the Liverpool Lime Street to Norwich service. It seems as though COVID-19 temporary timetables has granted this service a stay of execution, with, as of, the, as of right now, East Midlands Railways are still operating this as a direct service. Whether that split will now go ahead and the operations transferred to another franchise, still we don't know. Also as part of the Manchester Recovery Task Force proposals, which I'll talk more about in a minute, Transpennine Express are now exploring the possibility of running a new service from Liverpool Lime Street to Cleethorpes. This essentially combines what is currently the Liverpool Lime Street to Warrington to Manchester Airport Northern service and the Manchester Airport to Sheffield to Cleethorpes service. This would mean providing a second direct train per hour between Liverpool and Sheffield, but it would mean Sheffield and Cleethorpes would lose their direct service to Manchester Airport. So let's talk about the Castlefield Corridor. Now, in a quintessentially British way, when the rail industry is given three options, options A, B and C, they've decided to go for the fourth option, so-called option B+. This would basically be option B plus some sort of direct service between Southport and Manchester Oxford Road being retained as the loss of this service was particularly controversial. Now, Andy Burnham and other Northern leaders had been holding out in approving this timetable until they could get some sort of commitment to new infrastructure in the North, although they've managed to be very vague about exactly what infrastructure they had in mind. I've noted, nobody has actually mentioned platforms 15 and 16 specifically, so it's not really clear what they were hoping for, uh, but it now appears that some sort of agreement has been reached. Uh, the exact details of option B+, plus or option B++, plus plus or whatever it is now, are yet to be made public. The battle for capacity in central Manchester rages on, and right now everybody involved are the losers. Some timetables were cut temporarily in July as the UK went through its fourth COVID-19 wave, or as it's been popularly being called, the Pingdemic, due to lots of staff members having to self-isolate. The plan is to get all timetables pretty much back up and running as soon as possible, it being September now, and people going back to work and school. Passenger numbers are continuing to grow in the absence of COVID-19 restrictions, now consistently above 60% of pre-March 2020 levels. Rather counterproductively, as both case numbers and passenger numbers have been simultaneously rising, the government made the decision to remove mask mandates on public transport on the 19th of July, in line with other COVID-19 restrictions being removed. 
The decision for whether masks should be mandatory or not has been essentially passed to individual rail and bus operators, most of which have continued to advise wearing face coverings, but with no enforcement. Transport for London, controlled by Labour Mayor Sadiq Khan, which has full jurisdiction over the London Underground and bus services in the capital, has continued to make masks mandatory. As have the various other uh, devolved mayors, although the, the limits of the devolved mayor powers have, have been made very clear by this mask mandate dispute. For example, in Manchester, Andy Burnham has made masks mandatory on the Manchester Metrolink, but it's not within his remit to make it mandatory on buses. In West Yorkshire, the only thing Tracy Braben could do was make masks mandatory inside bus stations. Of course, in the more properly devolved Scotland and Wales, masks continue to be mandatory on all forms of public transport, which creates a slightly funny legal situation where if you're on an LNER service from London to Edinburgh or vice versa, you suddenly are required to put your mask on slash allowed to take your masks off as soon as you cross the border. On the 17th of June, Avanti West Coast attempted to set a new high-speed record from London Euston to Glasgow Central with a Pendolino, the record having previously been set in 1984 with the advanced passenger train prototype, achieving London to Glasgow in 3 hours and 53 minutes. The 2021 attempt got extremely close, but missed out by 21 seconds. In electrification news, ahead of the aforementioned integrated rail plan, which will hopefully, hopefully contain more, the government have given the go-ahead to a short stretch of electrification between Bolton and Wigan, I should say re-approved, as this had already been approved and then cancelled, filling in a small gap in the now mostly electric Northwestern rail network. Still shiny new Class 707s, having been made redundant from Southwestern Railways, will start appearing on Southeastern services this month. The London Underground extension on the Northern Line to Battersea Power Station will open on the 20th of September. Elsewhere in London, Crossrail is finally approaching completion. No, this isn't Groundhog Day. An official opening date has yet to be confirmed, but it could be as early as February 2022, a mere three and a half years after it was originally due to open. The planned service pattern upon opening has been changed. Originally, the plan was to uh, have services from the Crossrail core terminate in Paddington and have the service split in Paddington, it will now run through Paddington straight away so you'll immediately be able to get a train from Reading and Heathrow Airport to Abbey Wood or Shenfield. Over on the continent, many services in Western Germany and Belgium were significantly disrupted by the flooding which took place in July. Some railway lines in Germany will take years to rebuild. The Swedish government have been planning to introduce new sleeper trains connecting Scandinavia and Europe. Now, I'd previously uh, wrongly suggested that there was a plan to create a single train from Cologne to Stockholm or possibly Brussels to Stockholm. This was wrong. It was actually two different services, one from Cologne and maybe Brussels to Malmo and another service from Hamburg to Stockholm. Well, the latest news is that the Swedish operator SJ has been awarded the contract to run the new train from Hamburg to Stockholm starting in 2022. But unfortunately, no bids were received to run the Cologne to Malmo service. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. This creates a slightly odd situation where the Swedish government are paying SJ to run a sleeper train between Hamburg and Stockholm in competition with the other private operator Snautoget, which is also operating that route, but nobody is running the Cologne to Malmö route, and that remains a gap in the network. European Sleeper and Moonlight Express, two startup operators who've been planning to introduce direct trains between Brussels and Berlin, have announced they are joining forces. This essentially means Midnight Express folding into the European, existing European Sleeper proposals to run a train from Ostend to Berlin via Brussels and Amsterdam with through coaches to Warsaw and Prague. This is being done in cooperation with existing open access operator Regiojet who are supplying the coaches. Yet another startup hopeful has announced plans to run sleeper trains in Europe. This time it's French-owned Midnight Trains who want to run services between Paris and 12 other European cities, including Rome, Madrid, Berlin and even Edinburgh. The aim is to provide high-quality hotel-style trains from 2024 onwards. At this stage it's not clear which service they're planning to concentrate on running first. They've said they want to start in 2024, but on which route we don't know. And we don't know what carriages they're going to be using either. Finally, a little update from Hungary, where tram train services between Seged and Hudmezo Vasárhely are due to launch this September. Viewers might recognise the Stadler CityLink tram trains as being similar to those in operation in Sheffield and Karlsruhe. You may have noticed I've started being a little bit more scrupulous in citing my sources and linking to them in the description, including Modern Railways, a monthly magazine who still don't pay me to say this, but you should go subscribe because if you've, let's be honest, if you've, if you enjoy 
rail news enough to have watched it this far in the video, you'll probably like the magazine. It contains a whole lot more detail than what I've condensed into videos like these. And there are also various web articles which I've linked to in the description if you want to read more. Thank you very much for watching and please subscribe.